This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Welcome to the American Theatre Wing Seminars on Working in the Theatre. These seminars are coming to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, which is on 42nd Street, right in the heart of Times Square. I'm Isabel Stevenson. I'm president of the American Theatre Wing, and this is one of a series of programs that the Wing does all year round. Before we go any further, I want to thank Bob Isaacson, who is the director of Cumbin, and Don Pascoe and his wonderful television crew that works with us here. The Wing is an all-year-round organization. Uh, we do many things, and we try to do them as best we can through the year to service the community through the theater. Uh, it was started as such an organization. We send professional theater to veterans' hospitals and private hospitals. We send Broadway and off-Broadway theater. We, under the umbrella of the American Theatre Wing, <coughs> sponsor a program called Saturday Theatre for Children, in which children of an elementary school age line up on Saturday mornings having bought a ticket to see a professional show. We believe that this commitment that they make to see theatre will in turn be the audience of tomorrow. It has already been proven that many of these youngsters have come back to see a Broadway show. The magic of Broadway is always there. The seminars are a direct outgrowth of the school that was founded at one time to benefit the returning veterans of the theater under a government-sponsored GI Bill. Uh, at the school, there were the great talents the knowledgeable people of the theater that contributed their services. It was Harold Prince and Richard Rogers and Kermit Bloomgarden and, and all the names that you can possibly ima imagine were part of the faculty. They contributed their services because they believed in sharing. I think that no other, no other profession shares so much with each other. And of course, there is the Tony Awards, which were founded by the American Theatre Wing and are presented by the Wing and the League of New York Theatres each week, each year, over a national television telecast. This is possibly one of the most exciting things that goes out from New York City to the rest of the country that says theatre is New York and New York is theatre. We have changed our format a little this on for this seminar. And we've asked this group of people that you see here, the Schubert Organization, to tell us what it is, how it works, and what it means to be part of the Schubert Organization. Jean Darrell and Henry Hughes, who are usually co-moderators, have taken a different position this time. They will question Jean as producer and director, and Henry as critic will have an opportunity to talk to the Schubert organization. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about them. The Schuberts began their careers in the early part of this century. By the 1950s, they owned or managed almost every legitimate theater in the United States. They're possibly older than the wing, not by very much, but they've been aligned with the wing. Uh, the famous stage door canteen was housed in the Schubert Theater on West 44th Street, donated by Lee Schubert to the American Theater Wing. Their archives reflect the extent of their involvement with the Broadway theater and theatrical undertakings across the country. They are not only interested in Broadway per se, but they're interested in the community as well. And I think as an organization, they've recognized the importance of the theater in the community and the importance of the community for the theater. Today, 81 years later, the Schubert organization is headed by Gerald Schoenfeld and Bernard Jacobs. And this organization currently owns 16 and a half theaters on Broadway alone. The Schuberts, as the organization is called, serve as producers and investors as well. And now, because there's so much to be said and done, I'm going to introduce 
the Schubert Organization. After I've said all of this, I know that the big question is this, Nicholas Nickleby, and why the $100 ticket? And I'm <laughs> sure that that's going to be explored many times here, and I think that the answers will be very important to us. I'd like to introduce Gerald Schoenfeld, Chairman, Bernard Jacob, President, Philip Smith, Executive Vice President, Robert Wankel, Vice President for Finance, and Lee Silver, Corporate Relations Director. I hope that you will have an interesting morning. I think that I will. Thank you very much for being here. Isabel, you, uh, Phil Smith is sitting next to me, next to Phil Smith is sitting uh, Gerald Schoenfeld, next to Gerald Schoenfeld is sitting Bernard, ja Bernard Jacobs, next to Bernard Jacobs is uh, sitting Mr. Wankel, and next to Mr. Wankel is sitting Lee Silver. Um, last uh, spring we had a meeting of the American Theater Critics Association and the distinguished critic Elliot Norton said that they, when, when you talk about the Schuberts, they were the bad Schuberts and the good Schuberts. And he said the bad Schuberts were Lee Schubert and J.J. Schubert, though not necessarily in that order. And the good Schuberts were Bernard Jacobs and Gerald Schoenfeld. <laughs> in that order? <laughs> not necessarily in that order. And I think we might begin uh, because because uh, Jerry and Bernie, as, as they're known to their friends um, and to their enemies, uh, <laughs> have really had to plunge into the Broadway scene uh, with and, and learn it from the ground up. They, they knew it as, as lawyers and as uh, theater goers, but they really, w when they found themselves faced with the responsibility of running this uh, uh, huge empire, which not was not quite as huge when they got it as it was when, uh, in the heyday of, uh, of the bad Schuberts. Uh, and I think that in, uh, it might be interesting to, if they could say something about the, uh, that the theater was in a fairly bad uh, condition when they, uh, when they started out. And I would, I'd like to hear a little bit from, uh, Jerry or Bernie, about or both about how they uh, what the condition of the theater was when they started in to to reform it, and uh, what they have uh, learned as they have gone along that would be useful to you people who are uh, don't planning to go into today's uh, prosperous uh, Broadway environment. I'd like to let Bernie answer the question, but I just want to give a preamble, if I can. Uh, you talk about the bad Schuberts, but uh, really, <coughs> if, not, if not for Lee and J.J. Schubert, uh, there would be no theater in America today as, uh, as we know it, and uh, we certainly wouldn't be here, because uh, they are the people who sustained the theater through the Depression years, and when uh, <laughs> hundreds of theaters were... Uh, destroyed and uh, left the landscape of America. So it was their tenacity and uh, their love of the theater and uh, probably originating at a time when uh, you had to uh, do business in a certain way in order to survive. And I guess, uh, although it today in retrospect it may not have been the uh, approved way, uh, in those days it uh, I guess was in the best uh, American traditions and uh, names today like Rockefeller and, uh, and others are, uh, are uh, revered, and uh, I think that uh, the, uh, the idea of, uh, of the bad and the good, uh, to a certain extent, uh, overlooks uh, a lot of the good. So I do. all of you on one panel as we have here. I'd like you to run down on the structure very briefly of what each one's role is in the organization. Okay. Well, Gerald and I divide the 
responsibilities of chief executive officers. Uh, we work together very closely. We supervise the uh, choice of attractions, the presentation of attractions, the investments that we're making shows, the productions <coughs> that we do, and also the real estate side of the business and the maintenance and the in rehabilitation of our theaters. For example, we've spent in, on rehabilitation in the last uh, five years probably $20 million. We also spend about $5 million a year on the maintenance of our theaters. We believe that our theaters are a national treasure and we want to keep them that way and we believe that any damage that's done to any, to any theater is a damage done to all of us. We want to see to it that the theaters are preserved and theaters are kept in the best condition possible and restored to the extent that they can be restored. Uh, Phil Smith is our executive vice president and he really supervises the administration of the entire business and the operation of the Schubert organization. Robert Wankel is our financial vice president and he's in charge of the exchequer and really he's made enormous contributions to the computerized ticket system which we've introduced, to the computerization of all of our business activities, to the accuracy of our records, to the fact that everybody knows that a Schubert statement has the integrity of the Schubert name and you can rely upon it completely, that there's never a mistake made by the Schubert's in connection with their financial determination. <laughs> uh, no, that our, our records are unassailable. If you speak to anybody in the business, <coughs> they will tell you that. If there's one thing that we stand for, we stand for integrity of account. We stand for a lot of other good things, we hope. <laughs> uh, Lee Silver handles our public relations, uh, our relationships with the press, our relationships with the public generally, and he's done a remarkable job in, <coughs> in creating this image of the good Schubert's against the bad Schubert's, but really, <laughs> I want to reaffirm what Jerry said, there are no bad Schubert's, that if they did not make the contribution they made to keeping these theaters alive during the Depression years, when everybody else would have torn them down and made parking lots out of them, because that would have served their economic purpose, we would not have a theater in America today. And uh, you saw during that period of time, many, many motion picture theaters demolished, the old Roxy, the, uh, the old Century, the Paramount, uh, never happened to theaters, by and large. And uh, uh, it's happening to two theaters, and I'm sure some of you are looking at me as if when I say it never happened to theaters. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the improvement of the Times Square area is uh, most important to all of us. And it's most important that we have a major development in that area where there has not been a major development since the 20s. That will help all of us and will help preserve our area and make our working conditions much better for everybody. Uh, I guess that's about uh, my description of what we all do. Jerry, can you perhaps uh, fill the people in on, the, my, on my question, which was that the, uh, uh, what, have you, what have you learned about uh, the uh, theater uh, as you have uh, simultaneously turned it around from a, a situation which was financially rather uh, uh, disastrous to one which today is, is financially quite prosperous? Well, really, uh, the, uh, the theater in, uh, in about 1969, 1970 season started to uh, go into a steep uh, decline. There was an attendant economic recession. The neighborhood conditions uh, in this area, if you think they may be bad now, were absolutely intolerable uh, then. Uh, the idea of people coming to New York uh, was uh, really <coughs> something to be shunned. And uh, we were dealing with a theater-going population that was uh, in ad advanced middle age and uh, dying of old age. Also, the theater was uh, uh, marketing its product in uh, the same manner that it uh, marketed it in 1900. And uh, the mix of uh, shows was uh, really geared to that uh, then existing audience. Also, the Schubert organization was uh, not involved in any way in the uh, financing or uh, production of plays. So uh, we set about to uh, try to change those things. Uh, although uh, some people here may, uh, may dispute the origins of it. Uh, the discount ticket booth originated from uh, a telephone call from John Lindsay uh, to us, and uh, we endorsed it. And, uh, 
it's recommended that it be administered, and it certainly has been modeled as be administered by uh, TDF. Bill Smith is responsible for the logistics of that uh, operation. Uh, we introduced uh, credit cards, seemingly uh, something that today is uh, to be taken for granted. You can call up a box office and just give your credit card number and you have your seats? Is that we can do that, and, uh, but that encompassed telephone reservations. So now you can use your credit card at the box office, you can use your credit card at the, uh, by telephone, and you can use your credit card in other ways to, uh, to purchase theater tickets. We also uh, were not responsible, certainly. Uh, I think Stuart Osco and Bob Fosse deserve a major contribution for demonstrating that television advertising would be productive. And uh, there's been a major change into that area. The uh, matter of the uh, community is something that uh, we directed our attentions to. And uh, fortunately, with the assistance of the entire theatrical industry, uh, we, and I shouldn't say we, the, uh, the League of New York Theaters and Producers created what we call the Special Projects Division which are funded by League members to the extent of about $500,000 a year, which represents $400 for a dramatic play, $600 for a musical play, and that money has been used <coughs> for many uh, projects. Uh, the I Love New York campaign uh, has certainly turned major attention to the theater. Uh, we have we set about to establish relationships with the working press with the uh, managers of all of the uh, television and radio stations in the city. We have regular uh, luncheons with uh, government people as well as uh, media people to uh, infuse in them the idea that Broadway theater is uh, a popular form of entertainment. We supported uh, shows which appeal to uh, young people, which appeal to minorities in order to uh, make sure that Broadway theater is not a uh, form of entertainment for the elite, but it's a popular form of entertainment. And all of these things, of course, uh, were able to bear uh, a lot of fruit when uh, <coughs> shows such as Equus and then especially Chorus Line uh, came on the scene. And we also deliberately stopped uh, talking about the theater in uh, moribund terms. Uh, we don't use the term fabulous invalid anymore because <laughs> We learned really that uh, uh, it's a uh, it's a negative uh, a negative concept, and uh, it's much more uh, much more helpful to say that the theater is really alive, the theater is well, and uh, we also believe too that uh, a live, prosperous Broadway theater certainly helps throughout theater in America, whether it be regional, university, uh, stock and amateur, or any other kind of theater. And in the same way, obviously, because we hear it every, uh, every day, a prosperous uh, regional uh, and uh, local theater means a prosperous Broadway. And we've worked hard to, uh, I think, eliminate these uh, artificial barriers that were created in the 50s and the 60s between profit and nonprofit theater, which really didn't serve any, uh, any one of the constituencies. I must say that one of, one of the legacies that you got from the, from the bad Schubert's was a Schubert Foundation with a considerable amount of money, which you have uh, used uh, wisely to uh, uh, engender theater uh, in, the, in the regions and, and off-Broadway and, and so on. Uh, and I think this has been uh, an advantage uh, both to the Denver Theater uh, and to you. Uh, I, I know you, let me, before you get into the detail, may I just add, I know you came to producing reluctantly because I was around when the, when you did, uh, I think, was it Pippin? Or, or it was some, it was, uh, it was one musical that was uh, in trouble and uh, you had the uh, option of, uh, of, of, of they, they came to you to, and they wanted you to, to co-produce it and you didn't feel that this was a proper role for, the, for a theater owner. At the same time, you wanted to save the show and as I remember it, you, you uh, became the co-producer, and then when the show became successful, you withdrew your co-production so that you would not be accused of, uh, of trying to uh, exert your advantage as theater owners as a producer. And can, am, I, am I misstating no, no, that? No, I, I think you're a little... 
little confused. Well, what was your first? What, what, was what your happened was that uh, Jerry and I assumed the uh, chief executive responsibility of the Schubert organization in, uh, at the end of June 1972. And about three weeks after that happened, there was a show called Pippin, which was uh, supposed to be presented in the Imperial Theater. And Stuart Ostro came in to see me and told me that he was short a substantial amount of money. And that uh, although he had originally budgeted the show for $600,000, which what a musical cost in those days is now about $3 million, just to show you what's happened since 1972, that uh, he had collapsed the budget down to $500,000, but he was still a $225,000 short. And he really asked us to invest the $225,000. Frankly, we did not, uh, uh, we were really tyros at the helm at that point. We did not have uh, the courage to invest that kind of money. We did not think we had the authority to invest that kind of money, and we were most reluctant to get involved. Uh, we had conversations with uh, the Kennedy Center where the show was booked into before it came to New York, and as a result of that, uh, Roger Stevens invested $100,000 of Kennedy Center money into the show. Stuart Ostro, I think, mortgaged his home and raised $75,000, and we invested the remaining $50,000, which made that show possible. Uh, while the show was, uh, was being previewed in New York, there were investors who came to us and wanted to buy a part of our interest, and we sold a substantial part of our interest off, because at that time, again, we were a bit timid about taking the risk of making that kind of substantial investment in the show, because under J.J.'s will, there was a stricture which stated that no more than $25,000 should be invested in any show. Of course, we were no longer bound by that stricture, but we felt at that point in time a kind of moral commitment to pay some attention to it. And for that reason, we were, we were glad to uh, relieve ourselves of part of the investment. Now, in retrospect, we probably would have been a lot better off keeping it because it was a highly successful venture. But uh, that's where we got our feet wet. From then on, we started investing more. We became involved in production. Uh, we think that, uh, that we have excellent taste, and we think we've chosen well. And today, of course, the situation is that if uh, the word is out that the Schubert's are interested in the show, uh, almost every significant investor wants to invest in it. So today, we are in a position where we are constantly turning people away, because we, we don't like to have a broad group of investors. We like to have substantial investors who can afford to take the risk of investing in a Broadway show. We, we think it's, uh, you know, it is a highly uh, risky thing to do, and, uh, and we do not like to assume the responsibility of having people of limited means invest in shows where we bear the responsibility of determining whether or not it will or will not be successful. On, on that basis, I'd like to go on with that thinking. I'd like to get to the nitty-gritty of your organization, of an organization of producing. You talked about <coughs> producing as apart from being theater owners. What makes the decision on producing in a show? What is empty, an empty theater, four walls? What are those terms, and what do you, does each one do about them? We're here to learn as much as we can about the Schubert and also about producing and what goes into a theater or, or organization. Perhaps Phil can tell us about the financial terms of a... Uh, what makes you decide to go into it? What's the percentage of, 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 of your investment in it? In, in general, I'm not asking for any figures. But well, just to give you an idea, we are producing Michael Bennett's new show, Dream Girls, which will open in New York on December 6th or December 7th, the weekend. We really haven't decided whether or not we will do what we did with Nicholas Nickleby, where we'll have the critics come on one day and the guests come on another day, whether or not we will have one opening on December 6th. In all probability, it will be December 6th. Uh, we became involved in that show because of our relationship with Michael Bennett, who came to us and asked us if we would want to be involved in the production of the show. Uh, we we ac accepted the, uh, the offer that Michael made after we saw a workshop run through of the show, we, uh, we felt quite confident about the fact that <coughs> we had a good chance of being successful. Uh, we then became involved with three other investors, Geffen Records, Metro Media, and ABC, and the four of us are, in effect, 
financing that production. Uh, do the two of you make a decision, or do you bring the whole organization into making this decision? Now? Well, I think we discuss things with the uh, uh, with other people in the organization, because uh, many people in the organization went to see the uh, the workshop run through. But essentially, uh, the determination of what shows you are going to become involved in, what shows you are going to book in your theaters, is an executive decision that has to be made by somebody who has executive authority. It cannot be made on a collaborative basis, because if it's made on a collaborative basis, it becomes a mess. Jerry and I have a <coughs> wonderful relationship. Usually we agree about most things, and so therefore we have there's very little area of our disagreement in those areas. Uh, we try as much as possible to involve Phil and Bob and, and Lee in those decisions, but essentially we have to make those decisions, and we do. Phil, I think you can answer uh, Isabel's question about the, I don't think some people know the uh, the financial uh, terms in which a, uh, a theater uh, is uh, leased to a, to a producer and how the, uh, and, and what the, what the theater owner is responsible for and what the producer is responsible for and, uh, and so on. Do you, could you enlighten us sure. on that? Well, so what union <coughs> you have to deal with in this? Well, in New York, there are about 11 craft unions involved in the theater. And there are many ways of structuring a booking agreement, but it's always tied into some share of the gross receipts. Uh, one process would be a four-wall rental that Isabel mentioned, where the production would pay all of the expenses attributed to the operation of the theater, and in addition to give the producer either a fixed fee, uh, the theater owner a fixed rent or a percentage of the gross receipts. Other ways would be uh, of sharing the profit dollar where the combined break-even, which would involve the theater operation expenses, production expenses, and then the profit dollar that was remaining would be divided with some formula by the theater owner and the producer. With minimum guarantees to the theater owner, I suppose. To cover actual out-of-pocket yeah. expense and some minimal rent. What is the percentage of the unions in a theater ticket? What, what percentage goes to um, the uh, craft union, so that the ticket has to be priced at 25 or 30 or 35 or 40. I think that would be difficult to yeah. break I mean, out there is if no the actors are getting paid. There is no, what, 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 what makes Isabel, that Isabel, ticket? Isabel, it's, uh, it's not a factor of, uh, of the union costs uh, alone. Uh, primary uh, factor really is, uh, number one, how expensive is that show to produce? And uh, when do you reasonably think you should be entitled to a return of your uh, capital? How expensive is that show to operate, which includes not only the unions, but of course includes the amount you have to pay to the theater, and especially the amount that you have to pay to your creative people in the form of royalties, which uh, is generally far in excess of, uh, of uh, union salaries. And then, of course, other aspects of your budget, insurance, uh, uh, advertising, payments of uh, the whole list of items that are in your, uh, in your budget, legal and accounting, and uh, the myriad amount of, uh, of expenses. And after you ascertain the totality of your costs, and uh, the totality of your uh, capitalization, then you uh, sit down and you work out the pricing of your, uh, of your ticket. And uh, the uh, probably union salaries uh, don't amount to more than, uh, oh, in a, in a major musical show, <coughs> I'm taking a guess, and uh, people here are I would say somewhere maybe, uh, if the show is grossing $300,000 a week, I would say, assuming you do not have a major star in that show, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of $40,000, $45,000 a week. That includes the musicians, the stagehands, the cast, the wardrobe, and so on. Has it always been so, Jeannie, when you were a producer? No. <laughs> <laughs> I produced my first show for $7,500 on Broadway. <laughs> 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 and the, uh, uh, 
uh, I had another one for $50,000, and the revival of Porgy and Bess, which I did with Cheryl Crawford, cost $19,000. That was done at the Majestic Theater, and it made a fortune for the Schubert's. <laughs> well, and by the way, let me say another word while I'm on the subject. Um, I re seem to remember that the, the, the bad Schubert's, who, by the way, were not bad. I love Mr. J.J. and Mr. Lee, both of them. Uh, they were legally restricted from producing or putting money in shows. No, not How from, did uh, you change that around? Not from producing. There was never any restriction on them about producing. The restriction on them was about booking theaters of others, and the restriction on them was uh, to divest themselves of a certain number of theaters in different markets throughout the United States. Uh, and then there were other business practices that were proscribed. Uh, happily, uh, that is now behind us, and. Uh, but there was never any restriction on the producing. And Bernie and Phil uh, have advised me that the number is closer to 55,000 a week. And uh, of course, uh, there are some variables in that. Not every show has the same number of stagehands, and not every show has the same wardrobe or other. Uh, uh in the old days, the, the in the old days, the theater owner had a contract that I believe was you paid uh, 25, you paid 30 percent to the theater owner if you grossed under a certain point, which was called the turn, and 25% if you went over that point. And one of the, what, was that, is that correct? Or yeah, well, yeah. There, there, I'd say in the pre Schoenfeld Jacobs period, yeah. the typical booking agreement was a sharing of the gross arrangement. And that would be for a straight play, something like 75, 70, 30 to 20, 75, over 20,000. And uh, the theater would supply a certain amount of labor for the show, uh, which was always negotiable. And the producer would supply everything else. And for a musical play, it was usually 75, 25, with the possibility that over a very high number, it might become 80, 20. The problem with those terms was that as inflation bore down upon us, those terms became more and more difficult for both sides because you would fix a sharing of, uh, of responsibility and a sharing of uh, financial obligation predicated <laughs> upon a formula which could, be, which could turn out to be uh, uh, harmful to one side or the other depending upon uh, which wages were increased and who had to pay for what. So you had to develop new and different formulas, which we started to do around 73 or 74. And we do believe that the development of these new formulas, which really came out of our heads, is one of the primary things that's responsible for the present good standing of the theater. Because the theater cannot survive under the old conditions. And you are seeing shows running for much, much longer periods of time because of the fact that the uh, provisions under which shows are booked into theaters now uh, permit sufficient elasticity so that the shows can continue to run and they can bear the burden of changing economic conditions as inflation bears down upon you. Because nobody can predict whose costs are going to become what as, as time goes on. Now, with Jerry's figures before $55,000 for a musical play, that does not include cast salaries, which depend upon whether or not you employ a star or not go up the sky. I mean, for example, there are, there are some musical shows on Broadway today which need about $240,000 a week to break even. Now, that's a lot of dollars. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the impact upon the finances of the production of a show, the most uh, stringent uh, impact is, is the royalty factor. Because if you do a musical and there's an 18% royalty factor, for example, for the composer, lyricist, and, and librettist, uh, the director, the design people, the choreographer, and the producer, uh, you deal with that 18% royalty factor, and if you're grossing $400,000, $72,000 is going to the royalty people. And each and every time you increase ticket prices, you're increasing the amount of money that goes to the royalty people. There is no, there is no way under present conditions of, uh, of increasing your costs without, with that, uh, compensating for increased costs without building into that compensation 
a factor that cover the increased amount you have to pay the royalty fees. Can't you put a ceiling on the royalty? Uh? Well, the point is that the Dramatists Guild will, uh, will not consent to that. The Dramatists Guild, uh, uh, the, the, there's going to come a point in time where as inflation continues, because let's face it, if, if costs continue to accelerate at the rate of 10 to 12 percent a year, a show that's costing $250,000 a week to break even this year is going to cost $275,000 next year, $302,000 the year after, $333,000 the year after that, and you're going to see ticket prices escalate, and you're going to see royalties escalate. And there's going to come a point in time when something's going to have to give on the royalty issue. Uh, if you take a play like Children of a Lesser God, which we are involved in the production of, that play is a highly successful play. I think, according to the last statement I saw, it made $3 million. Mark Medoff, the author, has been paid $5 million. There's a disproportion between what the royalty people get, and that does not include what the director got, which is probably about a third of that. There's a disproportion between what the royalty people and what the investors and what the theater operators get out of production. And if something doesn't give, it's going to have a uh, deleterious effect upon the continued prosperity of the American theater. I think it will give. There will be negotiations in this area. There have been lots of conversations with the Dramatists Guild, but really, up to now, they, they've not been going anywhere. They, uh, they basically would like to see uh, authors guaranteed more money up front, which they should be. Uh, but there's a general reluctance on their part to, uh, uh, to reduce royalties. As a matter of fact, uh, it's not just a reluctance, there's an unwillingness to, uh, to perceive that they have to reduce royalties. Uh, on the price right. of the, uh, uh, can the I price say a word ticket. there? Uh, the, the five, seven and a half, and ten percent uh, that, that it for dramatic show, which is the usual uh, uh, royalty, was based on grosses of between twenty and forty thousand dollars a week, and that was fair in those days. But now that the grosses are in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, th even to me, and I'm an author myself, I find that that's excessive. I would like I, to I, I don't mean I don't mean no. to uh, <laughs> to correct you, Jean, but the five, seven, and a half, and ten was done in nineteen. Uh, it was done in nineteen twenty two, twenty three, yeah, yeah. and at that point in time, dramatic shows were grossing as little as the five was not the five to five thousand dollars did not come yeah. out of the air. Lots of shows grossed under five thousand dollars. That's right. And some grossed between five and ten, and that's why. They went to seven and a half over five and to 10 over 7,500. I was it's thinking of my, when I came in. Well, you're, you're talking about, <laughs> you know, 15, 20 years later. But when right. that contract was negotiated, those numbers were significant. And really, today, what we should do is we should take that five and make it 100. We should take that seven and a half and make it 200 and make the 10 at 300. Then, then there'd, be bear, there'd be a reality between those numbers as they were in 1922 and the numbers as they are today. Is it possible to break down the cost of the Nicholas Nickleby $100 ticket? It certainly is one of the most exciting events to come to New York City. Before you get into that, let's no, let Jerry now. wants to make a comment. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry has had I his would, hand up. I would, <laughs> Isabel, this is, this is your forum, and uh, yeah. the, only, the only comment that uh, I want to make is uh, the conversation seems to be in... Uh, moving in the direction of really uh, generalized uh, theatrical uh, discussion. If you want to hear anything more about you know, the Schubert organization or what some of the uh, people do, fine. If not, then let's continue in the same Oh, I the same thought vein. that they will come into it when I talk about them. But you have, I'd like to know about the ticket, and I, because <laughs> that is what everybody says. Why does it have to be $100? It's the most exciting thing that's come to New York. I, I want to see it, but that's a lot of money for a ticket. Now, well, how do you, can you well, break it well, down? Well, let, let me no. attempt to deal with it. Uh, <laughs> I'm in trouble. You know, <laughs> if, if you did not scale Nicholas Nickleby for the price at which those tickets scale, Nicholas Nickleby could not have been presented in this country. As it is now, the probability is that the producers collectively will lose money on that production. Why did we pick $100? We picked $100 because, in our opinion, based upon the budgets we had for the production of this show, 
uh, based upon the number of tickets that we anticipated selling, we needed about $4,400,000 in order to cover the running cost of the show, which we budgeted at $3,200,000, and the production cost of the show, which we budgeted at $1,200,000. I do not believe that we will gross $4,400,000 out of the totality of the number of performances that are going to be presented. There were a lot of problems with this. First place, the company did not want to play on Christmas Week. They finally compromised, and they're performing once on Christmas Week, which if you say it's part one and part two, you can say it's twice. But they're giving one $100 performance. On Thanksgiving Week, they are taking a day off. They are not going to perform this, is it this Sunday or next Sunday? This Sunday. This, this Sunday. Sunday, they're not going to perform. They insisted that because of the enormous amount of effort that had to go into this work, that they could not do it four times a week for 13 weeks. They just did not feel they could physically survive if they did. So you had to provide for certain periods of time in which, uh, in which they would not perform. Now, since all of our salaries are paid on a weekly basis, in those weeks in which you get, say, one performance, uh, you have to lose about $250,000. So we, we, had a we had a deal with the totality of the number of performances we were uh, uh, we would be able to sell to the public. You also have to realize that when you introduce something like Nicholas Nicholson, the first two weeks, we sold practically no tickets. We did $100,000 week number one. We did $116,000, I think, in week number two. And last week, we did $246,000. So there you have a collection of 11 performances which brought you in about $450,000. Our cost for those 11 performances were probably about a million dollars. So we're $600,000 behind in operating costs as of the moment. What are you but taking the capacity per week? It's very difficult to tell you precisely what you take in a capacity. The theater is grossed to, uh, to achieve about $380,000. Of that $380,000, you know 4.5% goes off to the pension funds of the craft guild. Uh, since the ticket is so high in price, practically nobody buys tickets for cash at the window, so that you have to, practically everybody's buying tickets with credit cards, so you can say that 75% of the tickets are being sold pursuant to credit cards. That's about the way they are averaging so far, uh, which means that there's another 3% that comes off, if, no, 3%, because it would be 4% if, if, if all the tickets were sold on credit cards, it's actually 3%. So that when you take that 7.5% off the gross, you are dealing with a number that's about $28,000 less than the 360. Then you sell. Uh, we discounted uh, the Wednesday performances, which obviously are the weakest performances. We've offered them to students of uh, practically the all The American the Theater Wing, I hope. Yes. <laughs> we've, 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 we've offered them to all of the students in the New York area on a group basis to buy those performances for $60. Uh, so that, again, uh, reduced our capacity. I don't believe that the Wednesday performance, again, which is the most difficult performance to sell because it, that's a combined audience. The Wednesday matinee audience is usually a female audience, of, uh, and, and usually there are very few males in the audience. The Wednesday night audience is a typical, is a typical audience. Now, to combine those two audiences to get, uh, uh, to get people to join together to attend the show on a Wednesday, is something that they've been reluctant to do, uh, or they were reluctant to do. Now, of course, the Wednesday performance is selling because that's about all that's left to sell. So, and if you want decent locations, uh, probably the Wednesdays are the only times when you can get decent locations. Did you have to sacrifice some of the seats in the theater for the production of the show? We lost about 100 seats mm -hmm. because, you know, in, in addressing ourselves to our course, there's another fact. The theater, to all intents and purposes, has been demolished because that set has been uh, that set has been constructed and, and, and has created an environment in the theater. Uh, th this is just not a piece of theater; it's a piece of environment. They are really bringing you back to Dickinson times, and anybody who has seen the show would recognize that. The cost of restoring that theater when we are done with the pr presentation of this show which will be absorbed not by the production, but by the Schubert organization, will be, in my opinion, in the neighborhood of a million to a million and a half dollars. Can't you do a lot of other Dickens revivals? And <laughs> 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 no, 
but again, again, <laughs> I don't want to make it appear as if we are putting that other million to a million and a half dollars, because yeah, that would be a misrepresentation. The Plymouth Theater, because of the fact that it's been constantly occupied ever since Jerry and I assumed the management of the Schubert organization, is in need of a major renovation. Mm -hmm. But where that major renovation could have been forestalled for a period of time because it was in pretty good condition. After Nicholas Nickleby leaves, we are going to have to restore it in a way in which we never dreamed of restoring because a lot of the ornamental plaster has been destroyed. There's been a lot of demolition that should, should have been avoided, but unfortunately was not avoided in the taking of that attraction. Well, knowing that this is a break-even proposition at best and probably a loss proposition, why did you do it? You want to take that, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> if you don't want to, I will. You finish, you finish, relations. you finish Nickleby. You well, finish. <laughs> <laughs> well let, me, let me put it this way. I went to see Nicholas Nickleby in London. And after I saw it in London, I determined that it would really be a venal sin if American audiences were not given an opportunity to see this show. And I Cardiff. went to, uh, uh, I went to Stratford. Cardiff. 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 <laughs> which, which is worse, a Cardiff? I'm an expert on or city or over here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the expert. I'm uh, clarify this. Anyway, after I saw it, I traipsed to Stratford to meet with David Briley and had conversations with him. And there was some agreement upon the fact that we would be involved in some way in bringing Nicholas Nickleby to the United States. Of course, you were faced with a, with a, with a logistical problem because the RSC was terminating its run of Nicholas Nickleby at the end of June in London. It was then going to do the taping, which uh, you all saw referred to in that mobile ad, which will be aired sometime in 1983 in this country on uh, public television. And uh, after the taping, they had 14 weeks in which the company would be available in order to perform in the United States. Only those 14 weeks. Now, one of the choices we had to make once we decided to go ahead with it was if we imported the British set, we would lose two or three weeks because of the shipping transportation of that set. So we decided we would build a set here, which uh, added a couple of hundred thousand dollars to, our, to the cost of the production we would not have had a face if we were able to use the British set. But af after, after you saw that show, you realized that, that really we haven't had that kind of theater in this country in a long time, if ever. And I, in my own mind, like to put it this way. I think that a chorus line really started the real revival of the musical theater in America. It encouraged people to believe that, that there, was, there were new energies in the musical theater, there were new creative efforts, and that there was a big public out there wanting to see good musical theater. I hope, and I still hope, that Nicholas Nickleby will ultimately have the same impact upon the dramatic theater. We'll encourage our writers to write, our directors to direct, and our actors to become involved in, in plays like Nicholas Nickleby. I would like to see us able to produce plays of that quality in this country. I believe we have a sufficient store of good American actors and good American directors so that if they're motivated properly, they can do that kind of work. And I hope that Nicholas Nickleby ultimately has that impact upon our American actors, directors, and creative people. It already has. You know, in our seminar on performance, Amy Irving said that the cast of Nicholas Nickleby, who do uh, warm-up exercises and classes in, in disciplines, are taking on some of the Amadeus group because the theaters back up and hopefully They'll take on other actors. There's a discipline of, of British actors that, that will be very good to have passed on to our American actors. And I, I'd also like to ask Mr. Silver, um, is this part of the image that you are uh, creating yeah, in the Schubert yeah. organization <laughs> of bringing a show like Nicholas Nickleby to America? Does that, is it, it's an important contribution to the theater. Is that part of your job in well, the Schubert organization? When, uh, when Gerald and Bernie took me on, uh, they said, uh, we don't want you to do public relations. The, we just want the public to know what is being done. And there's a whole difference. You don't create an image. The image is created by what the company does, by, by what 
uh, the organization does as an instit as, as the largest part of this thing uh, called institutional theater. And one of the things that Gerald left out when he was talking about the many things that were done to bring the theater <coughs> into the 20th century, so to speak, the Schubert organization, which is a very large commercial institution, uh, went beyond just trying to find product that was uh, the song and dance, uh, the, the tired businessman. Schubert organization uh, uh, took on bringing to the theater those things which they thought the mainstream of, of the, uh, the country should be witnessing. And they went into various areas. Uh, Schubert uh, was very responsible for the success of The Wiz, although it was not a show produced by The Wiz. Schubert brought in Zoot Suit. Schubert brought in Harry Chapin. They wanted to bring in things to get away from Henry uh, Hughes's elitism of the, uh, with respect to the theater into the mainstream. People should see theater. And Nicholas Nickleby is a part of that philosophically. Thank you. I think that we're going to take a short break now. I don't, I don't know that I said anything about being in favor of elitism. Henry, you will get 30 minutes at the end <laughs> to rebut. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm all for the, for, for the, uh, for the hundred dollar ticket. Uh, uh, it's a great democratic uh, uh, answer to uh, to the theater. Uh, are, are we you breaking? No, you can continue. Oh. I, I think that we would like, uh, in the sec after the break, I, I would like to get into the question of, uh, as you know, J uh, Jerry and Bernie being uh, uh, lawyers as well as produ as uh, theater owners and producers. Uh, they've done most of the negotiating for the League of New York Theaters with the craft unions. And I remember a long time ago, I was taking a course with Joe Melziner on uh, scene design, and he said, when you have your set of Hamlet lying on the sidewalk outside the theater, waiting to be taken in by the, by the, uh, by the stagehands, and it starts to rain, he said, there is a way to get the set in the theater, he said, but it's not by making them care about Hamlet. <laughs> and I think that Jerry and Bernie have learned uh, a, uh, a way of, of dealing with the craft unions that is uh, tough and yet and, uh, of, at the same time friendly and effective. And I would like uh, after, the, after the break uh, to go into that. Meanwhile, I, yeah. I am determined also after the break to have Bob Wankel speak <laughs> and tell a little bit of what he does. I've been trying to do it for quite a while. Well, we have five minutes before the break, so why don't you, why don't you do All that right now, then. Bob? Well, let me just... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just want to give you a little orientation because Bob will probably not do it. Over, over seven and a half million people a year go to shows in Schubert theaters. And at any given week in the year, between 2,500 and 3,000 people are on the payroll of the Schubert organization. And it is Bob's responsibility to handle the revenues that come into the box offices from those people and also take care of all of the other myriad parts of the financial operation of the Schubert organization. So now, Bob, <laughs> please elaborate. <laughs> Well, um, I suppose like any, any major company, there's many um, items that go into the financial operations of, of a company and, and a lot of nitty gritty and just trying to keep pace with Jerry and Bernie and accounting for what they do. Um, <laughs> but I mean, we have a staff of about 40 people in the accounting operation that includes audit and data processing. Um, and I think our biggest accomplishment in recent years is the fact that we have begun to computerize the industry. And uh, four years ago, a decision was made that we had to computerize the box offices to really enhance the ability to market our tickets as well as to control the accountability of ticket sales. And uh, we entered into an agreement uh, with uh, Control Data and Ticketron to um, buy a system and to help develop it for us. And during the past two and a half years, we have computerized all of our theaters. We'll be finishing the uh, last theater this month. And uh, in the next year, we'll be making some major changes in ticket distribution by opening a computerized uh, central telephone reservation system 
and we'll be interfacing our system with the Ticketon system and be making our tickets available across the country on the same availability that you can get at the box office. So we think that's a major accomplishment. We're also in the process of computerizing our accounting applications to be able to produce the information needed on a more readily basis. And as Bernie said earlier, we believe that we as collectively uh, have the integrity of the industry in terms of the accountability that we give to all of the producers that play the Schubert houses. Hi. Hi, so the, I just uh, want to add one thing to what Bob has not said. In each and every year since we've assumed the management of the Schubert organization, as a result of the figures that Bob has given us, we know that we have made more money each year than the year before, and more people, we grossed more money than we did the year before, and more people attended the theater each year, which is the most important thing of all, than the year before. And we have all of those figures, which we never used to have on a comparative basis, and they're all available to us so we can tell exactly where we are at any minute of the day with reference to the entire operation of our business. And Bob is responsible for the supervision of that. He's done a monumental job. And without the help that we've received from him, we would never be able to be in the position in which we are today and probably never be able to do anything like Nicholas Nickleby. <laughs> <laughs> You're a very young man. Where do you come from? Where do you <laughs> what was your background before you came into the I was in organization? public accounting, and I worked for the audit firm that audited the Schubert. <laughs> I think we can turn now uh, to, the, if you were to, to be back break. in five minutes to discuss uh, Schubert's and the Union. This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York.